So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session this morning. Um, uh, today's guests really need no introduction. Um, on my left, I have Vice President Mr. Katayan uh, of the European Commission, and on my right, I have the President of uh, Nea Demokratia and the leader of the opposition in the Greek Parliament, Mr. Mitsotakis. Thank you very much both for joining us today on, on what we think is inevitably an incredibly important uh, topic for Bruegel, but uh, certainly uh, for the things that we do here at Bruegel, and of course, naturally for, for Europe. We would like to engage to, uh, with our two distinguished speakers today on a discussion on their view uh, of, of how to reform Europe, what are the important things, steps that we need to do, and how do we go about establishing a consensus. And uh, both of, of the speakers have expressed an important desire to speak with our public, both the people that are here today, uh, as well as the people who have joined us uh, through live streaming. And I'd like to remind you that you can actually uh, post questions to us. I uh, will be monitoring this uh, via our Twitter account on the hashtag of Ask Bruegel, and we certainly encourage you to do that. Um, so I would like to immediately then start the conversation, if I may, and attend to you, Vice President, for, for uh, uh, your views on these very important issues. One of the things that we've seen, uh, in, uh, certainly uh, during the financial crisis, and certainly now as we are beginning to come out of it, and more convincingly so, is that there are important divisions uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, the unfortunate, uh, of course, event with, ex with, with the UK exiting is an important uh, class that has been developed. Uh, but there are other, other divisions, and they can be geographical divisions, uh, or they can be thematic divisions. And then the question is, how do we move forward? And, and the important thing is, and I would like to pose this question to you uh, immediately, is what, in your view, do we need to do to, uh, to establish consensus in order to make sure that as we advance, uh, we advance inclusively? So it's everybody that is, is, is advanced, it's not just the few, uh, and convincingly. Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much. I first want to thank Bruegel for the, uh, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to discuss with Kiriakos on Europe. We have done it several times before in uh, other occasions, so welcome to Brussels. I heard that we have a big day today. You, you can probably tell a little bit more about the, the honor you and your family will face today. So, um, yeah, there has been and there are still some divisions between the member states on various issues. But luckily, the South-North uh, division doesn't exist anymore as strongly as was the case a few years ago. At that time, I was uh, first the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister of Finland, and um, I failed it in my scheme, on my scheme. And so I, I gave my face for all the bailout packages. I, as a negotiator, as the one who pushed them through in the Finnish parliament. And at the same time, when I tried to convince our, my, my compatriots that it is necessary to do things like that, it was very uh, unpopular. And just I told this because um, it wasn't only me or, or, or what, what Finland did, but uh, this moment of time, the crisis time, created divisions, but it also created uh, a situation where political leaders were not enthusiastically, enthusiastically uh, pushing forward European agenda. Because everything you heard from Europe was quite negative. Europe was, was about bailout packages, it was about crises, etc. And it led to the situation where prime ministers or, or governments or members of national parliaments did not have any European agenda at all. And what you can expect, there cannot be consensus between the parliaments or between the governments if you don't have your own agenda. And this is my strong point. Um, uh, we have to keep our citizens on board uh, when talking about the future of Europe. And it's only possible if key political figures like prime ministers, opposition leaders, uh, part, members of parliament, uh, have something to say to their voters, what do they expect from the future of Europe? There should be a list of issues what political leaders are expecting. Saying that I'm, me as a prime minister, or me, uh, I, I as a member of parliament, I'm pushing for more secure EMU. I'm, I'm in favor of uh, um, 
closer defense cooperation. I'm in favor of creating better counterterrorism uh, mechanism to Europe. I'm in favor of creating digital single market or circular economy or whatsoever. So, so um, the member states are the owners of the EU. EU is not Brussels and even less European Commission. We are just one institution. European Commission is just one institution amongst the others in the entire EU. And the owners should have a strong view what do they expect from the future of Europe. In other terms, what are the return expectations of the owners? And I'm happy to see that the situation has started to improve. Uh, sometimes at the beginning of this year because of external challenges, also because of internal challenges, like uh, elections in the United States, Russia, migration, uh, fake news, uh, uh, cyber attacks, rule of law problems in Poland, uh, quite tricky situation in, in Hungary. So all those things together have functioned as a wake-up call for our leaders, which have started to, to articulate clearer than what was the case a couple of years ago, what do they expect from the Europe. So, uh, so I have to stop here just to repeat that, um, that we can have more broad consensus between the member states if member states and especially their leaders have a European agenda. Then it's possible to find compromises or, or at least start understanding each other much better than before. Thank you very much for that. There are a number of very interesting points, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to come back to, the, to those points. But before I do that, if I may turn directly to Mr. Mitsotakis and bring him back into the conversation uh, of, of this, uh, and, and I'm addressing you now as, a, as a, an active politician in the, in the, in the, in the Greek uh, uh, Parliament, and effectively I'd like to ask you the same question. I mean, how do we establish a consensus in the context of the European Union? Um, before that, I, I'd like to quote a number that struck a very sensitive balance with me uh, when, I, when I first saw it. The European the European Parliament had a survey uh, on the views that citizens have about EMU, and 48% uh, yeah, of, of Greeks believe that they have not benefited from EU uh, membership. So more than half of Greece uh, uh, believe that actually the European membership has not delivered any benefits to them. This was a very striking result for somebody who is Greek. Um, and also I, I think it reflects something that perhaps is beyond, uh, beyond the question itself. Uh, but it's an important one, and even if, if it's just a perception, it's one that could be rather dangerous um, and in terms for, for advancing the project of EMU. So my question really to you is, and now coming from a small country perspective, um, uh, how do we go about ensuring that the, the citizens uh, see the benefits of EMU, and how do we ensure our commitment to progressing with, with, with the project? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's always a, uh, a pleasure to discuss with the Vice President uh, who's one of the leading forces in, in driving forward the, the, the new uh, agenda that we're currently discussing uh, in Europe. Let me slightly question your fundamental assumption by bringing to your attention the fact that in spite of the intensity of the crisis uh, in Greece, uh, Greeks have been uh, very supportive of our membership of the Eurozone, even during the most difficult times. Uh, current polls, uh, because it's a number that we constantly track, indicate that three out of four Greeks are supportive of the, uh, of the Euro as a, as a concept. And uh, there's, there's uh, you know, 20 to 25 percent share of the population that is probably quite anti-European and doesn't see any benefit of our participation uh, in, the, uh, in the European Monetary Union. I think this is, this is important because we need to be very clear that the whole issue of, uh, you know, of a potential Brexit has been put to rest and that Greeks currently realize that our future uh, is within um, the, the Eurozone. And my ambition is for Greece uh, no longer to be the poster boy for the problems of the Eurozone, but to actively participate in the discussion of how we can take the, the, the Eurozone, and for that matter, the whole European Union, uh, forward. And uh, this is a debate we need to have um, uh, in, in Greece. And it's also a debate that is, to a certain extent, tainted by the fact that uh, uh, all our recent memories uh, are associated with the fact that we have been in bailout programs for the last eight years. So essentially, we 
have uh, given up part of our national uh, sovereignty in exchange for bailout assistance and a lot of the reforms that have been imposed upon us are uh, connected in the mind of, uh, uh, of Greeks with, you know, with Brussels or with, uh, or with the IMF, with some sort of uh, ex external uh, mechanism that is, is ramming down reforms <coughs> down our throat. Uh, when we talk about reforms in Greece, people immediately think in terms of tax increases and pension cuts. So we need to make a a very systematic effort of convincing the, the, the Greek people that the, the real reforms that form part of the European agenda uh, are reforms which are good for Greece and are also good for a strong Greece uh, in, a, in a strong Euro. How, and at the end of the day, the reason why the Eurozone architecture failed had to do with the fact that there was not enough convergence on the structural side. We had a common uh, we had a common currency, but there was real divergence in terms of the underlying competitiveness of the economies of the Eurozone. And, you know, it took us eight years um, to realize this. But I think that Greeks currently realize that we need the domestic ownership of this reform agenda. How is this related to Europe? And I think your, your question was exactly relevant. What would I expect as, as a Greek politician uh, from, from Europe um, uh, in order to justify to my uh, electorate why it is important for us to be part of the European family. Of course, we need to complete the architecture of the, uh, of, of the Eurozone and to make sure that whatever asymmetric shocks in the future will be addressed um, systematically within the European family. We don't need outside assistance uh, uh, in this sense. Uh, the eventual creation of a European monetary fund, in, in my mind, uh, is an absolute necessity. Completing the banking union, uh, common guarantee um, uh, deposit scheme, uh, and of course we can talk about the architecture of managing um, the, the eurozone uh, and, and the governance issues. There are various uh, ideas on the table. They need they need to be uh, discussed. But the other aspects of the agenda, very important for us. The new, um, uh, the, new, the new budget, where are the funds going to be directed? How can we get help in terms of changing the underlying structure of the economy and be more competitive, more export-oriented? Uh, how, how can we benefit from the digital agenda? I expect Europe to help us manage our borders. Uh, Europe's borders are Greece's borders. Greece's borders are Europe's borders. So external border management in a Schengen zone is a must. I feel embarrassed as a Greek, and this is a personal experience, when I went to Strasbourg 10 days ago, I was taken off the tarmac in Frankfurt, sent to a different terminal, had to wait 20 minutes in line to show my passports to enter uh, um, uh, Germany. That's not acceptable. Um, we, are, uh, we cannot have internal border um, uh, controls uh, within the Schengen zone, but in order to make sure that the Schengen zone properly functions, we need to manage our external borders. So I expect, I expect this to be a common project. I expect European defense and the PESCO agreement to be a common European project, and I expect Greece to lead uh, because we are a country that is spending more than 2% and has significant capacity when it comes to pooling resources on the, uh, on the defense side. I expect uh, the, the digital uh, agenda to help Greek entrepreneurs and to turn Greece into a, you know, a startup hub and to bring back you know, the talent uh, that, that exists in, in technology and in the entrepreneurial scene uh, in Greece. I want Greece to be at the forefront of the common energy market uh, uh, and uh, to be a renewable powerhouse as it, as, as it can be and to explain to my citizens that an integrated energy market is going to benefit both Europe and Greece. So I think there are various, what I'm, let me conclude by saying that there are various aspects in, in terms of the broader policies of the European Union that go beyond the Eurozone. Uh, which are particularly relevant for Greece, because the more we keep the discussion in Greece about the Eurozone, the more we'll be talking about bailout programs, and the less we'll be missing the bigger picture, because what we're talking about here, and you know, the, the new agenda and the new ideas proposed by President uh, Juncker, but also by President Macron, are bolder than that. They don't just talk about the Eurozone. They talk about you know, a united, prosperous, safe um, uh, Europe in a rapidly changing world. And after Brexit and with uh, the U.S., moving in a more isolationist, uh, uh, towards a more isolationist uh, direction, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's mandatory that uh, we, we, we have to be together to be prosperous and safe. And uh, I feel very comfortable making this case to the, uh, to the Greek electorate. Uh, 
Thank you very much for that. Uh, very, if I may pick on a couple of points to come back to you, Vice, Mr. Vice President, on these issues. Uh, Mr. Mitsotakis mentioned three things which I think are very much discussed at the level of the Commission. But I'd like to ask you, how, how do we go about ensuring that we do complete them? There is banking union, there is controlling our borders, and there is a digital agenda, which are three very important, the digital single market, effectively. How do we make sure that the countries are on board on all of this? And, and, you know, the politicians, the political agenda, as you describe, actually makes a move on this and to, to create a Europe which is a lot more resilient. I think the core word is uh, trust. Trust between the member states. Because if you don't have trust amongst the member states, then nothing will move. And this is uh, especially true with uh, the further deepening of EMU. I think we need to deepen the, uh, deepen the EMU structure. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect. And here we have to, uh, at the same time, reduce the risks of member states and share the risks of member states. But we cannot get one without another. We cannot expect anybody to be ready to share the risks if we don't do everything in order to reduce the risks. So uh, the, the economic crisis um, created quite uh, challenging situation in this regard and, and we have to start uh, we, we, we start uh, we have to learn to trust each other again but it only comes from from uh, doing things together and doing things separately because if you uh, if any country belongs to the eurozone or the eu as a whole it means that your responsibility as a politician will be extended over your own borders you are not only liable to your own borders but also the rest of Europe. So everybody must be ready to do what they share in order to keep the union in one piece and, and secure and step by. And everybody must be ready to help the others if something unexpected happens. So the trust is, um, uh, uh, is a, is a uh, key word and responsibility which is extended over your own national borders. As I said before, I'm happy that um, from all those uh, external challenges and sometimes also internal challenges, um, well, they have been kind of catalysts to, to wake up national leaders to, to set the EU agenda again, which was not the case for a couple of years ago. And, and now leaders are talking, like Kyriakos just mentioned, the president of France and, and the others have uh, set the agenda. And what I have said to many leaders from small member states that don't wait what big countries are proposing. You are the owner of Europe as well as the bigger leaders are. And you have duty but also opportunity to set the scene for the future of Europe. So, what I would like to see is a competition of good ideas, how to reform EU. What are the priority areas? I fully agree, border control, defense slash security, uh, EMU, circular economy, trade policy, digital single market, capital market union. Those are more or less working process already now, but, uh, but we need a strong national leadership and ownership in all those projects. Thank you very much. May I, may I use some of the words from, the, from, from Mr. Tainan to come back to you, Mr. Mitsotakis? If I can ask you to comment on two things that I think are very crucial and not, in words we use and we, we hear a lot, the issue of trust. How do we regain trust? And, and I, I like the term of competition of new ideas. How, would, how do you think Greece can contribute to this competition of new ideas? Well, trust is a very uh, elusive term. And there's internal trust, and there's external trust. Uh, we are suffering, uh, in, in you know, across the democratic world, from a lack of from a lack of trust. Uh, and the truth is that uh, there is a general perception that elites, especially liberal elites, have failed in in pursuing an inclusive agenda. And this is what, to a certain extent, has given rise to the forces of populism. And populism is a lurking threat. It's here to stay. May have been defeated in certain countries, but the fundamental forces that, that drive it are not going to go away unless we solve the, the, the problem of, uh, of inclusive growth and unless we tell a story where 
most citizens will see themselves as part of the story rather than a story just to be told in, in Brussels think tanks or in, uh, in, in national uh, <coughs> think tanks. Uh, trust is also about honesty uh, and about delivering on your promises. Uh, I consider that to be particularly important and again I bring my Greek perspective to the, uh, to the, to the table. It's no longer good to, to lay out a very bold uh, electoral ambition if you cannot follow on your promises. Uh, in an interesting um, study which I saw in, in Greece, when we asked Greeks, do you prefer politicians to give you hope or to tell you the truth? Overwhelmingly, people chose the second because they're burned. They've been burned by false promises. So the trust is, is, is being rebuilt, first of all, by delivering on your promises, beat Europe at the European level, or beat our domestic promises. You cannot get elected by saying things that, you, that you're not going to deliver by being, by, be, by, by being inclusive, by making politics, again, uh, attractive to, to people, by pushing the idea of, uh, uh, of public uh, service, and, of course, by delivering results. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, our, our job if you're European level or the local level, is to solve people's problems and to make people's lives better and to let people, you know, develop to their, to, you know, um, as far as they can based on their own capacity and don't put uh, additional constraints uh, on them. So, uh, uh, and, and of course, then there is, you know, the, the, the problem of the, uh, uh, the European trust issue, which brings us back to the first question that you asked. What are those topics that people will uh, actually uh, understand? What do they associate? Um, you know, Europe, uh, Europe with, and you know, and, and you know, sometimes it's, it may not be the most, uh, the most expensive programs. Huh? You know, Erasmus, for example, our generation, uh, was probably the single most successful program. It didn't cost a fortune in terms of building a, you know, a, Euro a European, um, uh, a European identity and making us understand that we are part of something bigger. And that is why I also think that aspects such as culture and education. Uh, need to be part of the new um, uh, European agenda. What is it that we, uh, why are we Europeans? It's difficult to define, but somehow we always know when we are in Europe <laughs> versus when we're anywhere else. But there's, there's something uh, about, about, uh, about Europe that, you know, if we just close your eyes and you just walk on the street, you know that you're in Europe and you, you're not anywhere else in the world. And, this is, uh, and this, is, this is subtle, but it has to do with our common history, our common, uh, our common culture, our common educational background. So these, I would not leave these issues uh, outside the scope of, uh, of the European agenda. And, and that's why I think that um, the, the, the debate about how do we take uh, Europe forward and uh, how, about, how do we use our funds uh, better. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Greece can contribute a lot to this, uh, to this discussion, as can, I think, all member states, provided we, uh, we look at the bigger picture. Uh, the danger is always that national politics are going to dominate the discussion. Uh, you mentioned, Ricky, rightly so, that with, we're, we're about responsibility and risk sharing and burden sharing. But look at the migration problem. If you have countries that are not willing to accept a single refugee out of the European relocation schemes, and you have Greece with 50 or 60 or 70,000 refugees and, and, and migrants trying to make this, uh, this work, it doesn't take much for trust to break down. So uh, at some point, and uh, there I think we need to be, um, maybe we need to be more, uh, uh, more proactive uh, as, uh, as, as, as a union to, um, to make the case that, look, um, risk, bur uh, risk sharing and burden sharing is, is part of our common understanding. If countries don't um, uh, share the burden because they feel that this is not going to be attractive to their domestic audience, tough luck, there will be consequences.